science, technology, and medicine. And the recordings of progress. All right. Um, and so I'll just give you a, a couple of a uh, few quotes uh, to sort of set a bit of the tone here. I'm talking about a sublime of design, um, a few different phases in this, a kind of providential design, industrial design, and digital design. Um, uh, from uh, Erasmus Darwin, Charles's grandfather, dull atheist could a giddy dance of atoms lawlessly hurled construct so wonderful, so wise, so harmonized a world. A little bit later, uh, in sort of peak of a high modern aspirations, uh, we normally think of uh, the space launch and the Apollo mission is a kind of classic of the technological sublime of power. Uh, but James Webb, the head of NASA at the time, um, in all of his uh, public speeches and statements, uh, they're always like this. There are approximately 2.5 million solder joints in the Saturn V launch vehicle and 2 million moving parts. He emphasizes continually the number of moving parts, the complexity of the operations that all had to work together in a smooth mechanical ballet. And last but not least, um, from uh, a now seems very dated piece from 1996, uh, The Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace by John Perry Barlow, Esther Dyson, and several others. Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind, where cyberspace consists of transactions, relationships, and thought itself, arrayed like a standing wave in the web of our communications. I think I'm, uh, part of the goal here today is to persuade you that um, while these are very, very different um, quotes, um, there is something, uh, a certain sublime aspect to a world of design uh, where you have a sense of a, a mastermind that has put together, whether it's an omniscient creator uh, or the wise hand of the manager, uh, the very visible hand of the manager, that has brought together uh, a vast diversity of components in an intricate web of interrelationships and interactions and constructed a kind of socio-technical system of sublime speed and reach in which um, mobility is enhanced to uh, unheard of degrees. Um, the goal is a kind of seamless web of fast-flowing interactions that are always understood to be in the end, harmonious if properly designed. So I'll give you a bit of a, a sublime introduction <laughs> uh, to the story. Um, I'll talk a little bit about sublimes of power from the romantic sublime to the American technological sublime and contrast it with the sublime of design, which was much more a sublime of knowledge rather than of power. Um, and then talk about uh, some of the context for this, uh, creation of a world of grids and flows and then talk a little bit about uh, the rise of an anti-sublime, uh, sort of uh, the sublime of design's evil twin, you might say, um, a destructive sublime of viral corruption, what it stands for. All right. So my goal here today is to advance, um, I guess I'd say five linked propositions about what I call the sublime of design, which the quotes I gave hint at, and persuade you that they can help illuminate important aspects of both modernity and management. The first proposition is that there are sublimes of design that are related to but distinct from the more familiar sublimes of power. But another way there are sublimes of omniscience as well as of omnipotence. The two are intimately connected as power and knowledge always are, but they are intertwined things not one thing. Second, these sublimes of design have a history and that history is worth examining for sublimes of design highlighted and valorized particular aspects of God, nature, and humanity, and so have been parts of what Sheila Jasanoff uh, used the phrase socio-technical imaginaries. That's a wonderful phrase. And third, sublimes of design have appealed to, inspired, and legitimated the work of specific people in society, particularly those who design, manage, finance, and make policy for large, long-lived, integrated, insulated socio-technical systems. That's a lot to say repeatedly, large, long-lived, integrated, insulated, socio-technical systems. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to refer to them in shorthand as grids. Now, grids encompass not only the infrastructural grids of power, water, waste, transportation, and communication, but also large, complex physical entities such as skyscrapers or big factories, 
which are grids themselves, even as they are nodes in other grids. <coughs> Sorry, I'm recovering from a cold. Fourth, these sublimes of design have been parts of changing visions of the socio-technical order writ large, and of the role of the manager and the expert in that order. In particular, they have been part of visions that have prioritized mobility and seamless continuous flows over place and bounds or limits to those flows, and that have prioritized making the socio-technical order legible, and therefore it was presumed manageable, at ever more pervasive and ever more comprehensive levels. <coughs> that is, it was part of a conception of the manager, especially the high-level manager, as an expert information worker and decision maker who needed a god's eye view <coughs> of his or her grid in order to maximize flow. Ah, sorry. And fifth, while technological sublimes rooted in displays of dominance and sheer power over nature and over other people have inspired horror as often as awe in our late modern society and so often take the form of anti-sublimes of toxic, desolate landscapes, technological sublimes of design were reinvigorated and reinterpreted by the advent of digital communications and computing technologies, so much so that scholars have begun to ask whether the digital sublime is its own new thing. Uh, one of my favorite headlines ever was in 1998, the Washington Post had a special section on sort of the new digital era. The headline for that digital section was, everything has changed. Well, that's news. <laughs> everything. I, I love that. However, I will suggest uh, in the conclusion, uh, this is much more suggestive uh, than proven, uh, that the sublime of design increasingly has been countered by... Uh, I guess you might say it's, its opposite, its dark side, an anti-sublime of viral corruption. With the rise in emotional power of this anti-sublime, beginning with end-of-millennium concerns about the submergence of the self in the global net, and accelerating dramatically after the global financial crisis of 2008, which coincided with changes in the algorithms of major social media platforms such as Facebook that have amplified extremism and disinformation, and then amplified even further by the COVID pandemic. To sum up a, a sort of general perspective here, um, technology and society and organizations within it are intimately connected in multiple ways. On one level, there are the functional affordances of particular technological systems. <coughs> Telecommunications technologies enable centralized management of far-flung systems because they allow real-time coordination and control, and such functional affordances are real and powerful. There is, however, another aspect to this relationship that is aesthetic, political, and even spiritual, an aspect grounded in particular specific visions of a specific kind of socio-technical order, which are often anchored in visions of sort of what an ideal moment, a, a sort of peak moment, peak situation, a sublime experience should be like. So the sublime is usually conceived as having to do with scale and scope, with power and grandeur, <coughs> <coughs> with being reminded of our smallness in relation to the Almighty. But there is another kind of sublime as well, one centered on the perfection of God's providential design, which later becomes the providential design of the industrial manager or of the, uh, the, the sort of the almost emergent web. And this providential design shows God's magnificent or that of the human designer and manager through the perfect, harmonious, reciprocal interconnections of diverse, disparate parts. It is a seamless web. And the sublime of design deserves equal attention to the sublime of scale. Both carry through in the modern era as technological sublimes, and so serve as aspirations that guide technological and organizational development along particular paths. In the modern era, these aspirations typically are expressed in secularized language, but the roots and visions of the sublime often give these aspirations a utopian cast and a kind of moral authority. More specifically, the sublime of organization, design, and harmonious, seamless interconnection is part of the aspirations associated with the creation of our modern world <coughs> of grids and flows, a world whose infrastructures enable continuous mobility, exchange, and interaction. In short, this is a talk about the sublimation of the sublime of design 
in visions of a world of vast grids and continuous flows, <coughs> all of which are designed, operated, used, and maintained through systems of continuous management. <coughs> in short, continuous flow requires continuous management. It is thus a sublime that depends upon and celebrates the great system builders and wise managers, not just the inventors who made Gadget X, but the inventor entrepreneur manager who created an organization that produces a new stream of gadgets that ties them together in a vast system. All right, so when we, uh, so why call this a technological sublime? Because though it is a chained expression and understanding of the sublime, it partakes in some of the emotional and moral spiritual power of the sublime. So now I'll talk a little bit about <clears throat> some of the traditional notions of the sublime. The traditional notion of the sublime is, is of course, the uh, kind of romantic one in which you have transcendence, um, but also universal law seen in wild, raw nature. Um, it transcends normal human scales of size, speed, and power, normal human perceptions of space and time. Uh, it's something that takes you out of the moment um, and brings you into some kind of contact with the eternal, uh, which is uh, both literally awe-inspiring, but also more than a little frightening. Right, and that's the kind of classic romantic sublime, which is the creation of a very specific historical moment, uh, the early Industrial Revolution, um, and it becomes a much more romantic version as the Industrial Revolution progresses. People have had sublime moments, but they only really are thought of as sublime and categorized as such in the Industrial Era. Which is interesting because that's exactly the same time when a new kind of sublime, a technological sublime, is created. And uh, one of the, the first uh, examples of the use of sublime language to refer to a human creation uh, is the creation of the famous Iron Bridge in the late 18th century. This was a, a brand new uh, use of this new uh, wondrous material that can now be produced in, in large quantities and shaped and molded to whatever ends. <clears throat> and here it was being used to create a bridge. Um, and most discussions of the technological sublime discuss this <clears throat> and point to language celebrating the sort of the size and the scale and the grandeur of this use. Um, but if you look at most of the discussion about it, what it's talked about is how this will speed communications. What this does is bridge things. It connects things. It enables faster flow and greater movement. And that is part of the sublimity of the bridge. Uh, similarly, a classic uh, image associated with a kind of high industrial sublime uh, is Charles Seeler's famous painting of these conveyor belts uh, at the Ford River Rouge factory in the 1920s. Uh, the River Rouge factory is famously you know, a kind of city unto itself. Um, and, um, and again, it's normally discussed in terms of, um, you know, look at the sheer sort of power and scale and size of this new landscape. Um, but what you see throughout in these images um, is uh, emphasis upon the constant flow and movement of things through the assembly lines and through this factory, that this is a great sort of interconnected system of all these different moving parts. And the, the marvel of it all is how it all works together to pr in this sort of seamless web, again, a kind of mechanical ballet. Um, Another classic example of um, a kind of technological sublime is usually the, the skyscraper, which is the sort of monumental symbol of the sort of triumph over nature and the attainment of a god's eye view of the world. Um, but of course, you know, what is inside skyscrapers is bureaucracies, <laughs> um, is offices that are all about uh, the production of the movement of paper and information from place to place to place. I had to, I couldn't get a picture inside the, the Chrysler building, but this is another sort of typical office building here. And what do you see from the top of these uh, great skyscrapers? You see grids. This happens to be Chicago um, from the top of the Sears Tower. Um, well, actually, that's an aerial photo. Uh, Sears Tower is way down there. Um, and uh, this sort of vast web of interconnections and the like. Similarly, when we, we hear uh, discussions of the railroad as the symbol of a technological sublime. Uh, a lot of writers have focused on the locomotive and its sheer power, um, but I think this is very much a sublime image of the railroad. This is um, Hopper, famous for Nighthawks uh, painting, um, uh, is painting of a kind of sunset and the railroad um, out in the west, and this sense of this sublime landscape 
was kind of stark, desolate, lonely, but connected to the rest of the world by the telegraph line and the railroad there. Uh, or Margaret Bork White's um, sort of aerial photo of the airplane over uh, New York uh, from the 1930s, um, <clears throat> which I think is a sort of celebration of this sort of God's eye view and the interconnection of things. So I'll, I'll leave that there as I to give you something to look at while I go on. So the sublime is found in nature with a capital N, a tangible sign of the power and majesty of God the Creator, an approach to the infinite, a stepping outside the normal passage of time in a sacred space for the time that matters is the eternal divine moment. It's also a moment of terror. To a romantic, the sublime isn't pretty or picturesque. To them, that's for the ladies. It's awesome in the literal meaning of the word, something that inspires that giddy feeling of euphoria mixed with dread, a sense of the terrible power of the creator expressed in the furious power of some aspect of his creation. <clears throat> One that nevertheless can endure and even be transformed in a positive way, because while one is a witness to the awesome power, one is simultaneously shielded from it. Wordsworth defined poetry as emotion recollected in tranquility. The sublime is the terrible power of God, witnessed in relative safety. In keeping with this vision of the sublime, the sublime is something experienced usually alone or in the company of a few kindred spirits, for little is so terrifying as the solitary encounter with the raw nature. And the goal of this encounter with the sublime is very much the internal transformation of the individual. Knowledge of the sublime is not pursued with instrumental goals. <coughs> As David Nye argued nearly 30 years ago in his American Technological Sublime, this romantic sublime evolved over the 19th and early 20th centuries when transplanted to the new soil of America in the Industrial Age. Um, he, by the way, has come out like just, I think, three weeks ago with a new book on seven sublimes. So I thought I was being all radical and adding one more sublime, and he's, he's added six more to, to move on. The American technological sublime quite quickly became a mass experience, not a solitary one. Indeed, sublime spaces such as Niagara Falls were so widely publicized that virtually no one could be surprised by the encounter with that sublime part of nature. No one came to them fresh. Indeed, in the American culture, the massness of the experience helped validate the experience as sublime. And the American technological sublime blended the natural and artificial and bound them together. It partook in the widely shared vision of America as a second creation, a landscape with enormous resources that required human intervention, that required humans to harness them to their full potential so that their purpose could be achieved. To leave that river undammed or that field unplowed or that forest uncleared is not merely a waste of resources, it's a sin. And while there was some elite opposition to this, uh, the common American reaction to sublime space was to enmesh it in technological systems that not only improved access to it, but also improved the sublime experience itself, uh, created a, a show. Um, a uh, classic example is you have the, the vast natural bridge, which is this um, kind of natural landmark in, in Virginia, where you have essentially a natural bridge. It's been it's enormous, right, in the mountains. <clears throat> well, you do just leave that and have a tour go by. No, you have uh, artificial lighting and displays and a narration over and music over loudspeakers to turn uh, the sort of sunrise and sunset over the natural bridge into a moment performance. To most Americans of the late 19th and early 20th century, an experience was no less sublime because it had been commercialized and been made a regularly scheduled performance. And this technological sublime relocated sublime places in space and time. Instead of being sacred places outside time in the eternal now of the Creator, they were now located at the leading edge of history, atop the eternally breaking wave of progress. This fit with American exceptionalism and its conception of America as breaking free of history and it cycles forward into an eternal onward march. <coughs> but the technological sublime, as David Nye describes it, faced a challenge that the romantic sublime did not. In a world of constant progress and invention, the wonders of technology become domesticated and then are superseded. The romantic sublime did face new threats in this age, too. Sublime spaces would be cleared away by the hand of progress. The place may be beautiful, but it's not a sublime space in the romantic sense if it has to be protected from humans. 
But this is less a challenge of the, the technological sublime, but a challenge that forces the prepared mind into a fervor of self-examination, less of transformation. It has become more of a magnificent enten entertainment that testifies to the rightness of things. And Nye details several different variations on this sublime, discussing the dynamic sublime of railroads and geometric sublimes of skyscrapers and industrial sublimes of mass production facilities, and the electrical sublime of white ways and great white ways and lighting displays. <clears throat> and he describes them all brilliantly. But he doesn't pull out for examination what I'm calling this sublime of design, a sublime of large-scale, integrated, insulated systems that enable continuous flows of people, goods, power, and water of all things needful. He notes that many of the engineers and observers of railroad and telegraph networks, skyscrapers and vast factories and world's fairs ablaze with light, spoke of the marvelous design of such creation. But again, he focuses more on the sort of familiar sublime of power, scale, novelty. But that focus on design, organization, on connection, on the providential design of large-scale systems enabling continuous flows is everywhere and it's worth exploring. As this one commentator wrote on the opening of a new canal, let our legislators be assured that while they are extending towards its completion, that system of improvement planned and carried forward with so much wisdom, they are putting into operation a moral machine, which in proportion as it facilitates constant and rapid communication between all parts of our land, tends most effectually to perfect the civilization and elevate the moral character of the people. Or, as the commemorative book for the <clears throat> laying of the first Atlantic cable wrote uh, on its cover, all nations, one great brotherhood, united by steam and telegraph. Sublime internal improvements for the nation can create the uplift in the masses that the encounter with the romantic sublime did for the individual. Or as you know, other ways to describe the sublime of design, we could use Walt Whitman. You don't usually think of thinking of technological things as sublime with Whitman. But he says, I'm sure, but the most typical and representative things in the United States are what are involved in our vast network of interstate railroad lines, our electric telegraphs, and our mail. The whole of the mighty, ceaseless, complicated, and quite perfect already, tremendous as they are, systems of transportation everywhere of passengers and intelligence. No works, no painting can too strongly depict the fullness and grandeur of these the smallest minutiae attended to, and in their totality incomparably magnificent. Or Daniel Webster, the network of railroads and telegraph lines by which this vast country is reticulated have not only developed its resources, but united emphatically in metallic bands all parts of the Union. And indeed, the hydraulic works of New York, Philadelphia, and Boston surpass in extent and importance those of ancient Rome. or take the many ceremonies at which great skyscrapers are sort of christened or launched as if they were great ships. Um, what happens to those? Well, what, that's, that's the moment when they're turned on and switched on and connected to the grid. Uh, indeed, uh, often um, uh, there's uh, some famous uh, openings of uh, skyscrapers in New York uh, at which um, the president in an office 100 miles away flipped on a switch and turned on the power to the skyscraper. And of course, this is followed by a mass pilgrimage to the observation deck where you encounter the sublimity of a god's eye view, which inevitably occasioned commentary on the wonderful workings of the machinery of the city, on how all the pieces fit together in a grand design, though the individuals involved knew not the design in which they participated. Or you might have the vast lighting displays that were common at World's Fairs from the 1880s onward. <clears throat> Um, famously at the World's Fair, uh, of the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, um, which uh, had, uh, I would, I believe over the course of its two years, almost as many visitors as there are people in the United States at the time. It's like this enormous uh, event. Um, one of the things that was most spectacular about it was it was uh, sort of a networked uh, World's Fair um, with electric lighting everywhere and every night and this was the big you know, one of the biggest hits of the entire uh, World's Fair was uh, millions would throng there well, hundreds of thousands um, it, well, tens of thousands at a time millions over time 
uh, for these evening lighting displays, which were these, uh, there were tens of thousands of lights that were organized in intricate sequences. It wasn't just a blaze of light that turned things on. It was uh, a light show. It was a performance as the lights would rush in from the outside and rush out and swirl around. It was a, a sort of marvelous uh, display of the synchronization of this power. Um, and of course, if you want to see some uh, really utopian language about a sublime, uh, all you have to do is read anything from the 1990s about the dot-com boom. <clears throat> so you have a transcendence of place and time and local scale through seamless interconnection in these um, sublimes of design. You're emulating the mind of God and his panoptic perception more than his sheer power. God the architect, God the author. That partakes of this tradition of natural theology and even more long-standing beliefs in God's providential design of nature. Um, and I, I could give uh, many quotes uh, from sort of natural theologians, but uh, at the same time that you have uh, the emergence of romantic styles in, in literature and poetry, you have the advent of, of natural theology. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll take William Bartram, a great naturalist who inspired generations with his descriptions of sublime nature. And again, he's usually quoted uh, referring when he talks about storm blasts on his explorations, um, but most of his book is really full of quotes like this. The animal creation also excites our admiration and equally manifests the wisdom and beneficence of the supreme creator um, some in their vast size and strength, others in the beauty and elegance of their color and plumage, having the faculty of moving and living in the air for the birds, others for their immediate and indispensable use and convenience to man. How wonderful is the mechanism of these finely formed, self-moving beings. How complicated their systems, yet one unerring un uniformity prevails through every tribe and particular species. If the visible mechanical part of animal creation, the mere material part, is so admirably beautiful, harmonious, and incomprehensible. What must be the intellectual system? What must be the mind of the God behind this? This more essential principle that secretly operates within, that animates these inedible living machines, gives them motion, empowers them to act, speak, and perform. That's a, a, the sense of this sort of providential design of nature. Now, there's a place and a purpose to all things. And just as the kind of sublimes of power are transformed from this sort of the balance of power shifts from God and nature to, to humankind, um, the same sort of shift takes place in these sublimes of designs. You know, to emulate the harmonious reciprocal relations of nature and their intricate complex perfection through somehow an almost omniscient foresight. It enables and depends upon mobility. It turns every place into a node and a seamless web Every place needs to be a site of continuous consumption and continuous production. And transcendence over nature is achieved through this kind of knowledge of and control of the variability of nature. For the world of grids and flows requires not only continuous management, but continuous maintenance, and continuous knowledge. <clears throat> now to create this world, Let's see, how am I doing for time? Okay. Um, of grids and flows, as we see, the sort of the, the interconnection of all things, the, the, the smooth movement, um, is connected to this sense of a sort of view of above, from above. This sort of synoptic view of the system is necessary for it to be designed, maintained, operated. And indeed, our world uh, is a world of grids and flows. All points connected, all systems go. We flip a switch and the lights come on. Powered by electricity that has traveled hundreds of miles through a web of wires that pulse and beat, linking the lives of millions. We turn a tap and water comes out, hot or cold, to suit our needs. With that water traveling through a vast, invisible network of pipes and pumps and purifiers before it reaches our homes. We get on highways and one ribbon of concrete weaves into another and another and another, tying home to work, farm to city, exurb to exurb. We step past the airport sliding doors and we are ushered into a system that aspires to be, and usually is, despite our complaints, a self-contained web of connections, almost independent of the world outside its air-conditioned halls. <coughs> <coughs> our modern lives are shaped by the flow of all manner of things, 
through these large integrated insulated systems. These systems are made to control the variability of nature and so to provide a continuous flow of power and light, food and fuel, information, and even innovation, for discovery itself becomes a thing that can be planned. Through these systems we regulate and order our lives together, enabling us to have what we want when we want it, so long as we follow the rules. And these socio-technical infrastructures that enable so much of our lives today these vast networks of power, light, water, waste, transportation, communication, and the global systems of production and consumption entwined within them are expressions of values and goals, not just technological necessities. They have a politics. And any politics depends not only on force and power, but on legitimacy. Now, efficiency itself can help legitimate some systems, but that usually isn't enough. Other values must be embedded, taught, celebrated, and so on like the skyscraper, a typical feature of the modern city and a powerful social technical system for organizing work. But the construction of skyscrapers, or any tall office building, can't be explained simply as a product of maximizing land value and high density urban centers. That's part of it, but not enough. They can't be explained as technological systems that maximize the functionality and efficiency of office work, as it's been shown time and again that these structures create horizontal silos with people associating with people on their floor, not the one above or below. They work well enough to organize work <clears throat> that they don't sort of fail and thus rule out them as modes of organization, but they don't work so well that they sort of are, require that mode of organization. So skyscrapers, since they become so ubiquitous, are satisfying some other set of social political goals. Um, in addition to maximizing rents and organizing work, there's something else involved. These infrastructures embed the values of what I call a chosen world in our lives. A dream of fulfilling God's purpose for humans by emulating God the architect, the master designer, making the whole world a second creation, a world whose materials and resources are created by God, but whose present and tangible order is chosen by people. Maybe not by you, but by people, not nature or more precisely by people who saw into the hidden order of things and built a second nature of human design out of it. And that is what the policy maker, the decision maker, the expert designing these systems needs to be able to do. The social technical systems beat out of these technologies um, were tightly integrated and highly interdependent. They were, for the most part, surprisingly well insulated from the outside world forming largely self-contained systems. And when they work properly, they control the variability of nature and produce continuous flows of all things needful. They enabled vast assemblies of people and machines to work as one, serve as a nation's nervous system and circulatory system, linking every piece into a whole. And part of this is a vision rooted in the sublime of design, a vision of a dream of continuous flow. Smooth, interrupted, constant flows, with one step seamlessly blending into the next, in an endless mechanical ballet of otherworldly grace and inhuman precision. Uh, if you um, <clears throat> ever see these, there is a whole series of uh, uh, short newsreels, film reels, produced by uh, industrial PR departments uh, in the 1950s called Industry on Parade. GE does this and different companies do these. Um, and there's almost always uh, a several minute sequence that's essentially um, setting the movement of parts through a complex automated assembly line to classical music. Um, my, my favorite is one about creating light bulbs that's to the Brandenburg Concerto. Um, and it's, it's, def it's this, this sense of this kind of harmonious whole being created out of the integration of all of these parts uh, with every step in the process having been conceived and anticipated ahead of time. Shall we, shall we try to, to uh, have a couple of Q&As uh, before 10 sure. o'clock? Give, um, give me about two minutes. I, I think we started about 15 minutes late, so maybe... Uh, we did, we did, we did indeed. All right. Well, uh, give me about two minutes and then we switch to Q&A. Sure. All right. Uh, well, then... Um, I will uh, simply um, uh, leave with a couple of uh, points that um, one is this the, is that there's a certain under, uh, assumption underlying this that that 
shapes uh, visions of what the role of the manager, especially the high level manager, decision maker, uh, the people who uh, chart the courses and design the structures for these organizations, that um, continuous flow, this sort of seamless continuous flow, is a good thing that it requires continuous management and it requires increasingly pervasive knowledge of the state of the system. That it, that it has to be real time, immediate knowledge, and it has to be um, an increasingly synoptic God's eye view, um, with a sort of apex of this being a sort of uh, <laughs> GPS sort of system where you're, we have this understanding of the position and location of everything at all times. Um, um, and that um, there is a sort of power to this vision, but it is um, that has been renewed in this digital age, but that there are very serious challenges to this. <clears throat> there are costs to information. There are costs uh, that making things flow requires enormous investments. Uh, it requires prioritizing mobility uh, over place. Um, it, re it leads to creating a world in which those who are mobile, um, the, I guess you might say the, the returns to mobility, uh, increase. And those who are stuck um, increasingly are left out. And our prescription is always to do things to increase your, your individual mobility, whether it's economic or social or physical. Um, but that there are real costs to this. And we are seeing some increased um, perception of this cost when you see the power of these sort of tropes of viral corruption, where uh, a local disorder, a local corruption, a local pollution threatens everything because it tends to spread through this system. Um, that, that sort of one and one response is thus to increase the God's eye view so that you know everything everywhere and can root out this corruption everywhere. Um, but that requires a sort of infinite, truly godlike capacities um, and can create the conditions for a sort of surveillance system uh, that is, uh, might be a cure worse than the disease. So I'm kind of rushing through at the end. Um, so I will just uh, leave with that note that um, aspirations for creating this automated God's eye view, um, uh, big data in the cloud, um, with machine learning systems, um, this sort of synoptic God's eye view of the corporation, the nation, the globe, um, the climate, these sorts of things um, are um, powerful, but increasingly being challenged. And it's, I think that we're probably going to have to re-envision the role of the manager and the decision maker um, in a world where we're bumping up against the limits of this uh, God's eye view of uh, a sublime of design. All right, so I'll, I'll uh, come to that hasty conclusion there uh, and hope that that was uh, entertaining, instructive, and uh, open for questions. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you a lot, Hunter. And for those who haven't, who are unfamiliar with your book, the latest book, and your all the rest of the work, yeah. let me just remember that what you're doing is you're writing the history of an organizational study uh, paradigm from 1920 to yeah. 1970, which you call the high modernity social yeah. science. Huh? Yeah, and, yes. and, it's an age of system. Yes. Okay. Yes, and 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 uh, it seems like uh, like uh, sublimity uh, mm -hmm. is uh, a continue is a continuity to open up the discussion. The question is: Is sublimity and the design of sublimity? Uh, the continuation and the try, the attempt to to make this kind of high modernity organizational theory paradigm survive. Yeah. You see the point. Yeah. Would you Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah. Well, so uh, I would say that part of the the goal here is to say this. You know, what I talked about was a very academic set of uh, ideas, um, uh, trying and the connections between that set of ideas and the social sciences and this transformed world um, of. A, of um, you know, large-scale organizations and world of grids and flows um, and, and how that sort of intellectual shift and that <clears throat> institutional shift uh, took place. And this work here is trying to say, well, there's, there's, a, there's a sort of cultural power. There's a, a vision 
that goes along with these visions of these large organizations and uh, their structures and then the, the systems. And is there something that, that kind of ties these together? And part of this is, is a sense of that there is a sublime in the design and the interconnection of, of things this, that I think underwrites some unexamined assumptions, like more mobility, more throughput, faster flow, more seamless flow is always good. Right? You, um, and that's a sort of unexamined assumption based on a sort of combination of aesthetics and values and sort of other kinds of preconceptions about how the world is ordered um, that is not necessarily wrong, but unexamined it, things can be dangerous. Right? In, your, in the introduction to your book, you have a phrase which uh, I like to cite uh, that some of us may, may uh, find it may be uneasy amid a vast inheritance of techno-social infrastructure built on logic of system structure and control. That would yeah. be the high modernity. Okay, yeah. guys, what, what, how, do you, how do you react to this? Uh, are we all working in this sublimity or is there a reason to have a workshop on American and continental philosophies of organization here? <laughs> I'm just okay. and any kind of comment, of course, very welcome. Yeah. Oh yes. So, uh, okay, we have a sublime and emic or idic concept. Damian, Damian, please. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, sure. Sorry, that was that was the full extent of the question, really. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh... Could you could you could you repeat the question so that we all get it? Uh, because yeah. yeah, is the sublime an emic or an etic concept? Uh, okay. Um, Do we understand this, <laughs> Andrew? Yeah. Well, so okay. So uh, emic is uh, kind of approach to the study or description of uh, I don't know language or culture in terms of. Uh, I don't know. It's it's internal functionings, the structures. Does that sound right? And uh, etic would be more um, describing it in terms of sort of the external shaping. Yeah. Uh, good. I remember <laughs> a phrase from a philosophy class long ago. Right. Um, well, I, I guess I would say uh, whew, that's a really interesting question um, because part of the notion of the sublime that uh, people hearken to and really one of the reasons why people get excited by it is there is a certain sense that, uh, and actually David Nye states this quite explicitly, that there's something in the sublime that really is universal, that everybody encounters it and has a certain sort of sort of brute reaction to it. Um, and so there's something excitingly universal about that. But um, I would say that the, the meaning we make out of that experience is very much um, a product of, of context and culture. So then um, a, a sublime, I think, is a way of, I'm, I'm going to say neither is the answer to that, because it's a way of mediating, uh, of, of kind of uh, interpreting an internal structure and, and, and envisioning it that to you makes sense in terms of something larger. Right? That That's a sense of like how, how the this particular structure should fit within the larger whole, right? And that's kind of what's a sort of sublime experience is very much seeing yourself in your smallness as connected to something much greater. Uh, and as, and um, which at times gets sort of in a much more egocentric view. It's like, um, you know, how, uh, you know, I can, my ability to see this place in the whole gives me power over the whole, right? Um, but um, I think it's 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 draws its power from this connection of I, I see how this structure, even my own self, fit into this larger system. So I, I think it's uh, it draws a power from attempting to bridge those two. Any comments to that, uh, Damien? Um, no, that was very instructive. Well, it's a very instructive answer. Um, I don't think you could derive the position you've arrived at from first principles. So that's a priori. Okay. Yeah, I think, which you, you'll be happy with, I imagine. Oh, well, I derive. 
Okay, um, so let me back up just a moment. You don't think I could derive this concept of the sublime from first principles as sort of the definition of the sublime, or you... Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. so, or the, okay. the mediatory position that position. you were outlining okay. on, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, any other other come? I, I, I have to I'm think just, about that. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> this is food for thought is kicking off the conference okay. thanks to you, Andrew. So, so that's very nice. Uh, I'm think I'm thinking also in terms of uh, Disneyland. I mean, uh, this is future world, uh, I, and I remember that Banksy opened a, an alternative to Disneyland called Dismaland. <laughs> Uh, which also, in a sense, were sublime, but another kind of sublimity. So, is there? Uh, it seems is this is this a future world uh, sort of continuing and giving life to this kind of sublimity, or is there? Oh, that's really interesting. So, here, I, I I love um, so as an historian and also as a parent, I love Disney World. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, though, changes when your kids get old. Um, so. There's uh, actually something, I, I give a lecture about this in class, about the creation of new kinds of artificial spaces in the modern world. And one of the things that the architects of new office spaces, in usually from the 60s onward, uh, places like Disney World, so forth, they, they, they articulate, I think this fascinating idea is that we're going to create artificial environments to free people to be more like themselves, right? that the, the normal social world we live in uh, imposes constraints that keep us from being who we really are. And thus, through creating these highly controlled um, environments, I mean, everything in Disney World is designed and literally scripted, right? It's, it's supposed to be an experience of sort of, almost sort of walking through a movie, right? Because it's, it's designed in very, uh, very, very, very tightly controlled ways but it's continually rationalized and, and explained as we are doing this in order to enable people, and Disney said this several times, enable people to be more like themselves, right? And so I think this is one of the paradoxes under, underlying this sort of a sublime of design, which is, um, you know, can control produce freedom, right? <laughs> can you really create this artificial space that releases the natural within people? Um, and I think that's one of the um, reasons why there's always a kind of anti-sublime, a counterpoint to all of these visions, and they can be very, very powerful. Um, and um, and uh, they, they express a certain sense that maybe what you think is beautiful and and a sense of, of kind of order in the world is actually a little creepy <laughs> and frightening mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. um so and, and we had we have a we have a, a comment by, Bre by brandon that i would could could you explain this and we I, for your information we're expanding this session with five minutes okay. so uh we just have a couple of minutes because it's so thought-provoking brandon can you can you can you tell us uh, your comment here, which you posted, but it would be yeah. nice to hear sure. your voice. Okay. Sure. Um, are you hearing me? Yeah. Good. Um, well, you know, just the, the you, you sort of brought up the paradoxical character uh, in your last comment, but, um, you know, the rhetoric of the sublime and the majestic images produced that give us this kind of awe, experience of awe of human beings achievement uh, and in, in sort of modern grid-like constructions and design. Um, is there much in the literature that sort of evokes this awe that recognizes some of the sort of empirical facts of how we bring about these marvels of modern design um, through what are probably not when we look at them to be considered sublime processes or yeah. even with the case of those who are leaders, um, particularly admirable moral qualities, right? <laughs> that we wouldn't say, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. some of the motivations yeah. and power at work act that actually bring about these marvels are things we uh, tend to associate with the sublime. Well, that, that's, that's a great question. 
Um, so th this is one of the ways in which uh, kind of the, the technological sublimes of, of modern world, whether they be ones more of power or of, or of design, um, I think are, are sort of fundamentally different from the um, sort of uh, either from the more sort of natural sublimes uh, of a kind of romantic art um, in that, um, you know, there, there's there is there is a sort of terrifying side to the the storm in the mountains for the romantics and so forth, but there isn't really a dark side, right? There isn't a like oh you find out that you know God has sinned in some way, right? In order to create this, right? It's it's terrifying power on display that reminds you, uh, um, you know, just how small you are and and you're not God, right? Um, but with these technological uh, sublimes, you have this interesting sort of there's a consistent way that these stories get told, right? And you have the celebration of this marvelous image, right? Uh, of, of this marvelous moment where you saw you know, sort of the world unfold before you and you kind of saw into the interconnection of things that, that human hands have made. And you celebrate it, Mark Allen, fantastic it is. And then there's almost always a sort of story of the mundane that follows. And to think that we have achieved this marvelous thing because, you know, we got gutta percha from India and it managed to insulate this cable so that, you know, the communication actually works, right? And so the, it's, and um, there really isn't too much sort of descent into like, and isn't it amazing that these horrible people made this wonderful thing? Um, they don't usually go there. But it's, there is a continual celebration of how these mundane and very diverse, there's a lot of emphasis upon how many different parts come together, have to come together. And, um, and there's a real periodization to how that's celebrated. One is it comes together because there's this visible hand of a manager putting it together, right? Um, and then the real late modern emphasis is on, isn't it amazing how order emerges spontaneously from the interaction of these diverse parts, so long as you put them in communication, mm. right? Um, and, and I think that's one of the things that this sort of anti-sublime of viral corruption challenges that, challenges the, the spontaneous order emerging part of things. Okay. Um, at the same time, it also challenges the benignness of the visible hand that orders it because uh at the same time so i don't know if that helps there thanks oh, yes. no wonderful it does. thanks yes. very much. <laughs> thanks a lot for, for for introducing this and that's i, I mean m emphasizing again for those who haven't read yet read hunter's work that uh, he is the historian of herbert simon and after that comes uh, 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 um, an account of social science in america as an age of systems, which basically has to do directly with what we're doing, that is organizational theory with a majority of an audience from a managerial world. Yeah. So, yeah. so are we, is this kind of high modernity organizational theory, social science, management science, is it moving into a sublimity uh, era or uh, producing kinds of sublimity that you've been speaking about? Yeah. Fantastic I, I introduction, Andre. One thing yeah. I would note is that there is a, a wave of interest in um, <clears throat> the spiritual side of management, and there are all sorts of uh, sort of retreats, which remind me of the S1 oh, institutes yeah. and so forth. But they're they're mm -hmm. coming back, um, and um, that that have a sort of um, framing the role of the executive in this sort of spiritual and even religious terms. A very um, that are are really quite fascinating. Um, so are, are are we going to canonize uh, Walt Disney? That's uh, next year. Maybe they're working on it in 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 the Vatican. I don't know. I don't know. So so. But anyway, thanks a lot, Hunter, for this. And we're now moving over to two parallel sessions. Thank uh, you. One one, thanks a lot, for, and hope you stay on, and you're welcome all the time, and we hope to see you again in, in our group. It was fantastic that you could make this. Thanks a lot. So uh, the two panel groups are, are run with, uh, by Francois Xavier and Hélène, and you can click into the links you have in the program. So bye-bye, and see you in the groups.
Hmm? Mais si on, on part d'ici, hein, du truc, hein, général. Ok, livre. 